that in our study we looked at the first eight verses, which did appear to be, in a sense, sexual in their own right, inasmuch as as that section had begun, so it concluded. Because you'll remember that in chapter 4 and verse 1, there was reference to the judging of the quick and the dead, of the appearing and the kingdom of Christ. And likewise in verse 8, the Lord the righteous judge and his appearing would give. And the suggestion was, you will recall, that perhaps what Paul was suggesting is that he was the dead one, that Timothy was the living one who would remain and in whom the truth would be preserved. Let's turn softly, shall we, through the last verses, come to the end of the story. I want to take your mind back 2,000 years, back to the capital of the seat of the serpent of power, for the city of Rome. Just north of the temple of Vespasian and Titus, the Flavian emperors, lies the Mamertine prison. It's only a short walk, less than five minutes. And that prison was built half a millennium before the time of Paul. It was literally a prison system that went back for hundreds and hundreds of years, and its dungeons excavated beneath the sewers of the Roman city were already ancient. And that sewer system kept the prison permanently damp and permanently cold. There was little or no light, there was no sanitation, and there was no warmth. <coughs> and it's believed that it was in that place that the Apostle Paul was incarcerated, most likely for both his first and second trials and this second in prison. But somehow, in the providence of God, this letter made it out of the prison and into the hand, we believe, of Timothy, to whom it was directly. <laughs> Below the main dungeons in that prison, 12 feet below, lay a circular room that could only be reached by being lowered through a hole in the floor. And in that room underneath, the lowest pain, the lowest pit, the lowest dungeon, they only put the prisoners that had already had death sentence pronounced upon. <coughs> it was known as the Tuviar. It was described by one writer as disgusting and vile by reason of the filth and the darkness and the stench. And into that hole a man went in the knowledge that he would only, only ever see the light of day because he was being brought out to life. The three forms of death that a judgment may have prescribed. Morte the farmer, death by starvation. Strangolate, death by strangulation. Decapitato, Death by the head. Every man in that hole <clears throat> awaited one of those. At the end of the room there was a door that led into the Cloaca Maximum, the city's main sewer. So if someone died there, they could simply throw the body straight into the sewer system. That place was enough to break the spirit of any man. That's where the apostle was, we believe. Not only at the time he wrote this letter, <laughs> but at the time he finally came forth from it, and we trust and we pray that Timothy has made it in time. No wonder, he said, verse 9, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. And that word diligence stood out, so it needs to endeavour to exert oneself 
Once the one version says, do your best to come to me quickly. Make haste, make speed, come as soon as you can. So Paul, who had been for so long at the centre of the truth's activities, is now desperately lonely. And that word, that little word, spread out, so it becomes perhaps a key to this last epistle, to do thy diligence. It's the word used in the second <coughs> to in chapter 1. When of an Easter Paulus, it says, he was not ashamed of my chain, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, spudaitero. Spuda, so it's the word used in the second of Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present thyself approved to God, a, a, a workman irreproachable, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's the word used here in, in chapter 4 and verse 9. And it will be the word found in chapter 4 and verse 24. Do thy diligence to God so to come before winter. You see, Paul was desperately in need. <coughs> of Timothy's visit. And one of the reasons why he needed to see Timothy so badly was, verse 10 says, for Demas hath forsaken thee, having loved this pleasant world and has departed under Thessalonica, crescents to Galatia, find us up to thou <coughs> Demas had been with Paul, incidentally, at his first imprisonment, says Colossians chapter 4 and verse 40. But he's left now. It may have been that he simply returned to the ecclesia at Thessalonica, but somehow we read verse 10, do we not, with the idea that perhaps Demas could no longer cope with the difficulties and the challenges of the truth under persecution, and so he left, and with the leaving of Demas, Paul felt that sense of withdrawal from him, that one once who had been a support was gone. And yet the record goes on to say, verse 10, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. And I suggest that the implication of the verse is that it was Paul that had sent Crescens and Titus forth on their fresh labors of his own free will. Now, how remarkable that that be the case, that this preacher who so needed the comfort and the company of his friends sent him away. So that the other brothers and sisters in other parts could be strengthened. You see, he needed these people in his life right now, but he had that spirit of selfless care that was driven by his own first principle. What will be best for the truth? I've seen Crescent and Titus away. First of all, only Luke is with him. Luke the doctor, who knew every ailment of the apostle. And obviously, Luke still had access to Paul to some degree. And no doubt he was doing his best to keep the apostles' physical and mental powers alive, despite the terrible circumstances of the moment. And so in this letter, smuggled out somehow from the prison, this appeal comes to Timothy in verse 11. Take Mark and bring him with thee, that he has profitable me for the ministry. Not for me, but for the ministry, he says. Bring him, bring Mark as well if you can. Brothers and sisters, if they did get me, And I hope that they did. <laughs> then with the arrival of those two, Paul had an inner group of three close disciples who would be with him at the end. Luke, Timothy, and Mark. A cluster of dear friends to witness to his death and to be with him to the end. And that unique group collected around Paul. Doesn't it remind us of the Lord's own special circle? The inner three who would be the watchers of his agony in the garden. And the witnesses of his death, Peter, James, and John, all with him at the end. And as the apostles time and drew near, you see, restored in Christ would be retold. <laughs> in the offering up of his devoted flock. Tychicus, verse 12, he says, I have sent you Ephesus. It's remarkable that these bread, of whom we know so little, were honourable men and true. And one thing we know about all things, about all things as far as Tychicus was concerned, is that he was Paul's apostle, Paul's emissary, Paul's sampler. 
He was sent to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, to Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, to Colossians in Colossians chapter 4, to Corinth in the second of Corinthians chapter 8, to Crete in Titus chapter 3, to Ephesus again, right here in the second of Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. He was a sent man, sent in the third John by the apostle on the labors of the truth. And I think this time, brothers and sisters, don't you, when it says verse 12, and Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, that he's probably the one bringing the letter to Timothy. Tychicus will be the bearer of this master. <coughs> with all these directions, sending out faithful brethren to the ecclesial world, there weren't many left. To be with Paul to comfort him in his hour of grief. Well, then he says, verse 13, the cloak that I left that show us with carpets when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Now, the cloak that's referred to here was probably a, a pinea. At least that's the Latin name for the garment referred to. It was a, one of those ones that we would probably refer to as. Like a sort of poncho, it's like a blanket with a hole in it where you could slip over the head, but it would, you could draw it around the body to keep it warm, like a blanket. You see. Well, why did Paul want to come and bring this cloak for him? Well, do you see verse 21? Do thy diligence to come before winter, he says. You see, you can visit the Mamertine prison, and on a hot day, when the sun blazed outside and was beating down on the stone streets and the stone buildings so that the citizens above sweltered in the Roman heat, in the apostles' time, the inmates of that prison, even on the hottest day, shivered in the damp cold that struck right through the body and chilled the bones. And what Paul dreaded was that if he could feel that chill in the summertime, how would he ever get through the winter? Try your best to make speed to get here before winter. And when you come, don't forget my cloak. And with that pleading, brothers and sisters, we're brought right into the cell of the apostle, are we not, to that moment of personal need in his life. It was cold. And yet how surprising, brothers and sisters, how the scripture works in terms of inspiration. Because, you see, whatever the circumstances might have been, that caused the apostle to pen this up to request. Hold your hand in the second of Timothy chapter 4 <coughs> and come back to the book of Isaiah in chapter 59. Because, you see, this is one of those things about the matter of inspiration. You see, inspiration was not just a matter of the words that God drove men by the Holy Spirit to utter, but the choosing of the name, and maybe the choosing of the circumstances of that name, were all used by God for his own purposes, above and beyond what the man might have known. <laughs> now, here's an example, because you see what Isaiah, chapter 59 says, verse 17, for he put on, don't lose Timothy, he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and the helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance, the clothing that was clad with zeal as a cloak. And with that cloak wrapped around him, the man of Isaiah 59, verse 18, it says, according to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries and recompense to his enemies. You see what the very next verse of the second of Timothy chapter 4 says, the cloak, verse 13, and now verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did have much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. That's Isaiah 59, verse 18, is it not? According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay, fury to his adversaries. And so the Spirit of God took up the writings, even in the need of the Apostle Paul, and overshadowed what was written for another purpose. That would draw attention to another Bible passage and another Bible promise. And perhaps the lesson, brothers and sisters, of this little matter is that you see how God moved men by his Holy Spirit to write. We do not exactly know, but that he did, and for his own purposes that such inspired utterances should be recorded, is undoubted. And so we come back to the record in the second of Timothy, and we'll read that verse again, verse 30. The cloak that I left with Troas, that Troas with Carpus, and thou comest bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. 
Now, these books might have included documents as well as writings. And but the parchments, now, now they were probably vellum scrolls. Why would Paul want Timothy to collect parchments for writing from showings? He could have asked Luke to procure fresh parchment paper from Rome at any time. <coughs> Uh, but you see, I don't think it was blank parchments that he had in mind, was it? The parchments that the apostle was asking for were, were parchments that were already written upon. Incidentally, there's already a Gospel of Luke in circulation by this time. A Gospel of Luke, the beloved companion of the apostle. Perhaps it was that... Paul wanted to read the story of Christ and be close to the story of Christ's own life and death and resurrection, to lift his mind out of the prison and into the heights of being with his Lord. The best way to do that was to do some Bible reading. Perhaps that was the reason for at least one of the parts. But you know, brothers and sisters, you'll remember when we spoke the other day about passing on the charge that we quoted Moses in Deuteronomy 31, passing a charge to Joshua, and David in 2 Chronicles 28, passing on a charge to Solomon. And in both those chapters, in both those occasions, it says that Moses wrote a book. And part of what was passed back to Joshua was the book in which were transcribed all the matters of the divine worship of Israel in the book of the law that Moses wrote, it says, in that very chapter that he passed on the child to Joshua. And, and well, surprise, surprise, in the second of Chronicles chapter 28, we're told in the very chapter where it says that David passes on the charge to Solomon, he wrote all the pattern of the things in a book. Part of what was passed on to Solomon was in written form the documents of the whole system of worship that Israel must follow at that time. So, why might it not be, brothers and sisters, that as Paul now is passing on the charge to Timothy, the amongst the parchments to be born are some of the documents of the Ecclesial Bible. The statement of faith original letters from the apostles themselves, and that those letters would need to be authenticated as the master copies of what the truth was in the apostolic times, because already there were things afoot that would endanger the truth, people who would lead others astray, people who would provide, as the second of Thessalonians chapter 2 says, forged letters purporting to come from the apostle Paul. How better to defeat that than to have master copies within the brotherhood that were signed off and authenticated by the apostles themselves before they died, men who could do so under the power of the Holy Spirit whilst it was still present in the community. It could well be, brothers and sisters, that part of the sacred deposit that Timothy was being asked to guard were the documents not ecclesial life and process of ecclesial teaching. But some of those he was bringing to Paul with his bottom book signed off. And that danger of false freedom that might undermine the truth was very real because by well, that's what the next verse says. It said, verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did meet much evil the Lord reward him according to his works. You see, there were people in the truth that would lead the truth astray unless there were Matters that could be documented for generations to come. Actually, if you just hold your hand again in Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 4, and come back to the first of Timothy and chapter 1. We're told this in verses 19 and 20. It says there at the end of the first of Timothy, these words, chapter 1, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith that made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what we thought, what we find in the first of Timothy chapter one is that there was a brother in the ecclesia of Ephesus called Alexander, who was this 
worship by the apostles for wrong doctrine. And now in the second epistle, we have an Alexander who will speak against the apostle Paul. So it may be that the Alexander the Coppersmith of chapter 4 is the very brother who'd been put out of the meeting for his wrong teaching, a renegade, a traitor to Paul from within the Ecclesia, a man who testified to the authorities perhaps that led to the arrest of Paul, perhaps even a man who was prepared to travel to Rome to testify against Paul and his first child. And if that was true, <coughs> then Paul had his own Jews. <coughs> a man from inside the circle of the truth who turned traitor and betrayed him to the authority. And Paul found that he was walking in the footsteps of Christ and experiencing the trials of his Lord. And he displayed the same spirit as Christ, did he not? Because in the end of that verse, verse 14, he says, the Lord will <coughs> according to his works. But actually the text reads, the Lord will. And I think what that does is it turns the apostle's phrase into a statement of truth, not a request for revenge. The Lord will repay him for what he's done as a statement of fact. In fact, it's a conscious allusion to another Bible passage, Psalm 62, verse 12. Unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his words. And that was the security, I think, of Paul's words. He left the matter of requital to God. But he most firmly believed that God would hold for account those who had done damage against the truth. And so he says to Timothy in verse 15, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So here's confirmation. See that this man spoke against the apostle. The revised standard version says, Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. This man, who was from Ephesus, where Timothy was. You see, when the thinking of the flesh is rebuked, the desire for revenge can be very strong indeed. That hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of the servant is real brothers and sisters, and it is perpetual. And so the apostle says in verse 16, he says that my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook. And see, that phrase, at my first answer, relates to the story of the defense in the Roman system that would have taken place in the apostle's case. And at the first hearing, which was known as the prima Actio, at that initial hearing, the judge would listen to the prosecutor's case. But if he felt that the matter was insufficient, if he felt that the facts were not decisive, the judge would close with one single word. Ampliato. More. I need more. I need more information. I need evidence. More evidence. And then he would adjourn the case to a final hearing and a final hearing. <laughs> So you see, when that initial defense took place, whoever it was that did come and testify against him, the judge wasn't satisfied. He didn't consider the evidence to be good enough. But what Paul really says, what Paul really felt was, that when that first hearing took place, no man stood with me, he said. <coughs> Not even the bread. Because it had all become too dangerous because four years earlier, just four years earlier, there had been a great fire in Rome. <laughs> and Nero blamed the conflagration on the Christians. And now the authorities are, are, are on the lookout for the members of the Christian community. And Paul was a real leader of that group. The ecclesia of the sisters had gone into hiding. <laughs> There was heartbreaking emotion in Paul's words here to Timothy that at his hour of greatest need, when the apostle's case came up for trial, he was completely alone. There wasn't one brother or sister there to help him. 
And, and some of you realize we are from the district, we're in the very language of the crowd. We hear the gospel echo, do we not? At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. That's 2026, isn't it? Verse 20, verse, verse 56. And all the disciples forsook him and fled. <coughs> and Paul knew what the Lord had felt like. And now Paul was going to ask all the moment into the tribunal for a second hearing, not before Caiaphas, but before the Caesar of the whole earth. But he walked in the footsteps of Christ, you see. His trial, incidentally, the last trial, most probably took place in what was known as Basilica Dubia, where the most serious cases of the state were heard, where the Emperor Nero himself presided. It was no more than five minutes from Casa Giuliana. And just as the, as the Apostle experienced that same sense of abandonment at the Lord, that at the end he was on his own, so he reveals the same spirit as his Lord would. When in verse 16 he says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. It's so easy, isn't it, brothers and sisters, to cast blame and to criticize and to accuse those who have failed us. It's very difficult to reveal the spirit of forgiveness in the face of neglect or betrayal. And yet Paul, who was so deeply conscious of his own sin in persecuting the ecclesia of God, he just wished only that the providence of God might rest upon others if there events of God might give him repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And his heart was in a far higher realm than simply that of seeking retribution on others. Whatever they had done or not done for him, I pray that it may not be laid to their charge. And then he says, verse 17, notwithstanding, despite that, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known. You see, that's really John 16, verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, day is now come, that he shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, says Christ. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And at this terribly Difficult moment in Paul's life. He was thankful, ever thankful, that the Lord stood with him. You notice that little juxtaposition of words, brothers and sisters. Verse 16. No man stood with him. Verse 17. The Lord stood with him. There are times in all of our lives where we truly feel that we're on our own. That there's no one who understands, no one who can help, no one who really cares. But there is always someone nearby. The Lord stands with us. Who do you think the Lord was, by the way, brothers and sisters? The Lord who stood with him. Well, Acts 23, verse 11 says, The night following, the Lord stood with him and said, Be of good to you, but as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And the clue of that passage is that the little phrase stood. And that's a code name for the angel. The angel stood. The angel stood. And I believe that the Lord that stood with the apostle on that night in Acts 23 was none other than Gabriel, who was the Lord's angel, but would be working with Paul in the matter of him be, being Christ to the Gentiles. And that's the same angel referred to in Acts chapter 27, when it says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Now, notice the similarity of expressions, by the way, in those two passages. On the one hand, the Lord stood with me and said, You must go before Caesar to Rome. And on the other, the angel of the Lord said, Fear not, thou must be brought before Caesar. What was the Lord in one as the angel in the other? It's the same, sisters, in both occasions. I believe it was the angel Gabriel. And that's the one referred to here in the second of Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Notwithstanding, 
the law stood with me and strengthened me. Christ stood with his men in the form of his special angel sent to empower Paul at this last strife in the testimony of the apostle. And in fact, that moment in the second of Timothy described in verse 17, it was really going to be the climax of the triumph, if you like, of all of the apostles' labors. Let me just read some words to you from what the Lord said in the Gospel of Luke. I'll read it first and then say where it comes from. But this is the finest example of what the Lord had promised he would do for his disciples. See, on one occasion, the Lord said this. Ye shall be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. But the promise of the Lord, that's Luke 21, by the way, verses 12 to 15. The promise of the Lord was that in the time of their crisis, they would be given words, they would be empowered with speech, they would give marvelous witness to the truth in the matters of the trials that they would be asked to stand, stand before them. And what we're being told in the second of Timothy chapter 4 is that when Paul walked into this law court on this occasion, verse 17, it must have been a truly terrifying experience. The emperor of the world was upon that judgment seat. The whole Roman Senate, the great men of Rome, were in attendance. Can you imagine how the apostle's heart must have quailed as he went in on that occasion before Emperor Nero himself? And the Roman Senate in attendance. You see, what the apostle remembered was a set of passages that burned so brightly in his mind that they screamed him right there. And his speech, his last defense of the truth, was going to be a climax of what we might describe, brothers and sisters, as the witness promise. Paul knew them all, I believe. And he knew that what he was about to do in that second and final defense would be the climax of all the witness prophecies that had gone before him. Now, this is not all of them, but these are perhaps the key ones. You remember Matthew chapter 24, when it says in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And likewise, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 comes here, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And again, in Acts chapter 22, when verse 15 says, For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou all hast seen and heard, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. How far? Acts 23 verse 11. The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou personally, bear witness also in Rome. And this was the sweep of the witness promises and prophecies that said that that witness would run from Jerusalem to Rome. And in this one man, the Apostle Paul, the whole commission of Christ would be realized and brought to its climax in this trial of the second of Timothy chapter 4 verse 17, when he walked into the emperor and made his final speech. <laughs> How our brothers and sisters, we wish we might have been there to hear that speech from the Apostle. As the Apostle of the Gentiles marched in the Basilica of Judea, as one description of him has given, a little man with bandy legs and a hooked nose and flashing eyes, he fixed his gaze upon the Emperor. He gave the lecture of his life. And with that last glorious, amazing speech, the truth had traveled from the high priest in the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem to the Caesar in the Senate of Rome. Had Christ said, Thou must witness of me at Rome, then he would give that witness, and Caesar himself would hear it. And the apostle marched in. 
filled with the confidence of those witness prophecies and gave that final glorious defense of the truth. You see, what Caesar would know, brothers and sisters, is that as that fierce little man stood before him, was that Paul had already won. <laughs> because before the apostle ever walked in to that trial room, he'd written these words. The brethren which with me greet you, all the saints salute you, chiefly they of Caesar's household. Philippians chapter 4, this is 21 and 32. And the four all stood for his final trial. The truth had already conquered the emperor's own household. <laughs> and so he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. At the end of his first words, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Could, of course, be an allusion to the power of Rome, the lion. But I think that the evidence of the passage suggests that perhaps this again was a biblical expression for deliverance from extreme peril. The lion represented the greatest of dangers. And I think, brothers and sisters, that what we've got here is Psalm 22, verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth. See, that was the cry of Messiah in the psalm. And that cry was no doubt heard out of the lips of the apostle in his time of need. And as you look at these verses, verse, just verses 16 to 18, you'll find that the words forsaken, Gentiles, delivered, lion, mouth, preserved, glory, kingdom, are all taken from Psalm 32, as Paul shared his Lord's suffering as Christ and Jesus. So Paul's deliverance from the mouth of the lion was true for his first view. But there would be no such deliverance at the second. Paul knew that this time he would not be speaking. That's why he's writing to Timothy in the first place. And that's why we suggest, brothers, is that perhaps the angel had whispered in his ear not only the words of witness, but to lift the apostle's mind to see beyond the end to the final glory of the kingdom. Which is what he goes on to say, you see. Not only did the Lord stand by him and strengthen him, but verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver thee from every evil work and will preserve thee unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. You see, what Paul experienced is that only when the truth is learned, brothers and sisters, does our relationship with Christ become real. We can study the Gospels as much as we like, but only when we set up to live the story of the life of Christ does our own relationship with Christ become real. Where does the Apostle's words come from in verse 18 here? Aren't these all the breathings of his Lord? You see, Matthew chapter 6, verse 18, Christ said, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And Paul says, and the Lord shall deliver thee from every evil. Christ says, for thine is the kingdom. And Paul says, he will preserve thee until his heavenly kingdom. Christ says, and the power and the glory. Paul says, to whom be the glory. Christ says, forever, amen. Paul says, forever and ever, amen. It's the spirit of Christ in his mouth, brothers and sisters. These are the words of his Lord. And Paul believed with absolute certainty in the divine power to deliver him from mortality to the glory which they will. Salute Prisca and Aquila, he says, verse 19. Salute Prisca and Aquila. Of course, they were very dear friends. They were in Rome themselves once, but now they're in Ephesus where Timothy is. So why write this? Salute Prisca and Aquila. It was not just because they happened to the same ecclesia as Timothy. It's because he would never see them. Please say goodbye. The president of Quillow, he says. My dear friend. And he says, please salute the household of Monisa Thorns. Something interesting about that, right, is if you come back to the first chapter, Second of Timothy chapter 1. You'll remember that at the end of that verse, it says this. 
Verse 16, the Lord gave mercy under the house of Abel and Sephora, so he got the rich me and was not ashamed of my shame. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord ground out to him that he might find mercy of the Lord in that day, and how many things he meant to done in the Ephesus, thou knowest very well. He searched for me eagerly and found me, says the revised standard version. So he wasn't ashamed of being associated with the prisoner. In fact, when you think about it, what Elisaphorus had really done was fulfilled the Lord's words in Matthew 25. For I was in hunger, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison. And he came unto me. That's what Elisaphorus had done, you see. For Paul. But you notice in this fourth chapter, verse 19, he says, Salute Christ when a criminal, but not salute only to Paul. He says, Please salute the house of only to Paul. And the reason why he says that, brothers and sisters, is because Anissa Forrest, their fine and wonderful brother, had already lost his life in the service of the truth. Anissa Forrest was dead. And hence the apostles' expression, may he find mercy of the Lord in that day. Isn't that true? Then not only did Paul have an inner circle, and a Judas. But he also had a John Baptist who had died before him as a forerunner. And when any supports died, <laughs> Paul saw the shadow of death drawing closer in his own life and knew that his departure would soon be at him. Erastus, he says, was to be about at Corinth. Of course, he came from Corinth, he was the chamberlain of the city, but Gone back to his home of leadership, presumably under the instructions again of the Apostle Paul, the strength and the brethren in that place. Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Now, Trophimus had been elsewhere, Jerusalem, says Acts 21, but he, he was probably en route back to Ephesus. So I think the implication of those things is that once he had recovered, he would also go to Ephesus, and Tychicus on verse 12 would go to Ephesus, and the reason why they're coming is because Timothy's about to leave Ephesus, and Paul would not ask Timothy to come without making sure that Tychicus and Trophimus were sent to look after Ephesus, and Timothy's absence, you see. The apostle was thinking about all the ecclesial implications of what he might do. And so he says, verse 21, to do thy diligence to come before him, to Eugulus, we could be in Cunes, and Linus, and Claudia, Claudia, and the brethren. Now, just stop and think about this. This is what we've got here in the second of Timothy chapter 4. What we have is two ideas juxtaposed in the narrative. In verses 16 and 18, in the middle, as it were, we've got the story of the impending trial and judgment and death of Paul. But on either side, verses 10 to 15 and verses 19 to 21, are the apostles' actions of care for others? The apostles' trial in the middle was care for others on either side. And we see him involved in an expression of sorrow for Demas, a special mission for Crescens, a new charge for Titus, a grateful recognition of Luke, an appeal for Timothy to bring back, a thankful dispatching of Tychicus, a warning against Alexander, a warm greeting to Prisca and Aquila, a salute to the family of Onesiphorus, an acknowledgement of Erastus, a note about truth, Demas left unwell, greetings from the brethren in Rome, that we've got to mention the 19 brethren up to eight ecclesias of six provinces. And there's a sense of the apostles' guidance and provision for all the brotherhood, and yet it's right in the context of his own impending death. You see, this is the story of that, that quotation, remember, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the ecclesias, even in the prison. Paul never stopped thinking about what will be best for the truth. 
And what's interesting is when we come to the gospel record concerning the trial and the death of Christ, what do we see in the gospels? A word of encouragement for Thomas, a thoughtful word for Philip, an answer to Judas who was not Iscariot, an eloquent appeal to Judas who was Iscariot, a compassionate look of understanding for Peter, a private conversation with John, a healing gesture to the servant of Elchus, a final and loving provision for Mary, his mother, a prayer of forgiveness for the centurion, the promise of redemption for the penitent thief, and on the last night of our Lord's life, brothers and sisters, the gospel the pact for all the things he did for other people. Paul had the spirit of Christ. One of the documents, by the way, that might have been bought by Timothy, could have been the proof of Paul's Roman citizenship. That proof would not prevent the apostle's death, but the document would alter the type of death that the apostle would experience. He'd not be delivered out of the mouth of the lion in the second trial, but instead of death ad leonum, common for the Christians from other part facing the lions, he would incur the penalty reserved for Roman Christians. The after death by the end. And so now the second of Timothy chapter four and verse twenty-two says, as Paul thought about his imminent death, he thought of the death of a man who inspired him, the one who outside of Christ had most inspired him, because you see, Paul had a hero, as a cycle hero. And of course, you know who this hero was. He was inspired, of course, by Stephen. And here it is, you see. The Lord had said, had he not, at the moment of his death, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that had inspired Stephen, who in Acts chapter 7 says, when he kneeled down and died, Lord, lay not the sin for their charge. And what Stephen had said would be quoted by Paul in the second of Timothy here, chapter 4. I pray God that it may not be made to their charge. Stephen had quoted the Lord, but Paul would quote Stephen. This was his source of inspiration. He'd never forgotten the fearless witness of Stephen had gone before him, not since the day of his conversion. He'd never forgotten the moments of Stephen's death. He could never forget that moment. He, it's of Stephen that he will say in Acts 22 and verse 20, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by him, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. But ever after, brothers and sisters, he was inspired by the snake. Do you know how Stephen begins his speech in Acts chapter 7? He said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. When the apostle begins his speech in Acts 22, he will say, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear. He's inspired by Stephen, you know. In Acts chapter 7, it says of Stephen, they cried out with a loud voice and cast them out of the city and laid down their clothes, preparatory to stone him of all that will say in Acts 22. They lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a villain, and they cried out and cast off their clothes. And part of the journey of Paul was to relive not just the circumstances of Christ, but also those of Stephen. And that brings us to this last verse, you see, because it was the Lord. Wasn't the brothers and sisters who said when he died, Father, into thy hands I can eat my spirit. And Stephen had died saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And now Paul will say, The Lord Jesus Christ be with us. See, there wasn't long to go. Second trial will soon be over. Paul will be the outcome. We hope that some of the arrived in time. We hope that Peter and Luke and Mark were there at the end and that they were with Paul when he was led out as they were on the Appian Way towards Ostia, the seaport, <coughs> which was where the place of the heading occurred. And we suggest that it was Paul's intention when he knelt and bow before the sword. That just before the blade fell, just before his beginning, he would say right at the end, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
and thereby end his life in fellowship with Stephen and with Christ. Because that was his thought about what he probably would do. He said to Timothy, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. What he really meant was that he desired that Timothy might experience the same close relationship with Christ that he had felt all his life in the truth. And how we should read the praise. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. As he has been with mine, and into whose care I intend shortly to surrender mine. Grace with you, be with you all, as the word is in the book. May we all enter into that relationship, says Paul, with Christ that will lead to the final army. How thankful, brothers and sisters, we should be for this last letter. That gives us such an insight into the heart of the apostle at the darkest moment of his life. In the words of the hymn, he says, When I am sad, sad at heart, teach me thy way. When earthly joys depart, teach me thy way. In hours of loneliness, in times of dire distress, in failure or success. Teach me thy way. Long as my life shall last, teach me thy way. Where'er my lot be cast, teach me thy way. Until the race is run, until the journey is done, until the crown is won. Teach me thy way. 